Yeah. Uh, we continue our session, and it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Olivier Pirano, who is one of the worldwide known experts in approximation of differential equations. He is the author of, I think, a dozen of very nice books. He's a member of the uh, Jacques-Louis Lyon's laboratory in Collège de France. So it's uh, our great honor to have uh, his lecture here. Please, Professor Perano. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I'll be happy to talk to you about radiative transfer equations and application to climate modeling. I have collaborators, uh, Francois Gols, whom you may know, and uh, Frédéric Echt, uh, Didier Smet, and Pierre-Henri Tournier, who helped me for the uh, uh, impl numerical implementation. Okay, so let me... All right, so uh, thank you for this uh, invitation. I think uh, the organizer have a good idea, very good idea to celebrate uh, uh, Lady, Professor Ladizenskaya. Um, her work on Navier-Stokes equation was how I learned the, a partial differential equation when I was in, in Cambridge in, in the 70s. So uh, I, I am in depth to uh, Professor Ladizenskaya. I would have liked to come in Leningrad. Uh, I would have liked to come in St. Petersburg today, but uh, as you know, um, there is some political divisions. Um, uh, by the way, I met Professor Ladizanskaya in 1985 uh, on the occasion of a seminar in her laboratory. So I take. Uh, I think we should not underestimate the the power of the scientists, and therefore I have a small message for the politicians. It's for my politicians, maybe your politicians, I don't know, but whoever suffers like me will join in sending this message, urgently find other solutions than violence to impose your view, because international friendship is at the basis of cooperation of research. We should never forget that. So, uh, climate modeling is a very uh, uh, important topic nowadays, as you know. And what is a climate uh, model? It is uh, uh, the, at the core, you have um, uh, Navier-Stokes equation for the atmosphere and for the ocean. And you have radiative transfer, which is the influence of the sunlight uh, on the system. Now you have many other things like uh, ice caps, chemistry of the atmosphere, clouds, earth albedo, agriculture, forest, etc. So it's a very uh, uh, multidisciplinary problem. And from the mathematical point of view, one of the biggest difficulty is a large scale difference. Like radiative transfer is almost in instantaneous. Um, and the, the difference between the wind and the ocean circulation, as you know, is very big. So I am not going to talk about the whole problem. I'm going to talk just about the radiative transfer and it's a connection with Navier-Stokes equation. Sorry for the <coughs> uh, typo. So if you want to know more about this, uh, the basic book set for a mathematician is the book of Chandra Seca, which is quite old now. There is a, a book by Pomranning, who is a scientist to work in the US, uh, which is called Radiative Hydrodynamics. It's written for mathematicians. And there is an English book, uh, which is uh, one chapter in the book by uh, Professor Fowler on, in the UK. Um, <clears throat> now, the, the scientific papers, uh, they are, uh, most of them are a bit old because the radiative transfer was an important topic at the time of the H-bomb. Uh, so it was subsidized by uh, <coughs> um, uh, Lawrence Livermore in the US and uh, CA in France. And my colleague, uh, Francois Gauls, Benoît Pertam, Bertrand Mercier, Claude Bardos, uh, they work on this topic and they have important contribution from the 80s. And there is a, an obscure paper which, was, which I didn't know about, which has an existence solution uh, by uh, some um, Spanish uh, writers, uh, colleagues, uh, Porzio and Lopez Puzo. So I'm sure there are some uh, uh, Russian reference that I have forgotten. And uh, please send me the Russian reference because I don't know everything. 
Okay, so what's the goal? So I took a very applied problem, uh, which is um, have to see what is the influence of the sun on the weather in the valley of Chamonix. You may have known, you may know the valley of Chamonix because that's where the Mont Blanc is. Uh, so this is a full three-dimensional problem <clears throat> uh, be uh, because the valley is very three-dimensional. Uh, so you have the Mont Blanc uh, here and you have the Chamonix city here. And <clears throat> there is snow uh, at above a certain uh, uh, altitude. Uh, the sun eats, uh, sends its radiative uh, electromagnetic radiation to uh, to this place, uh, and uh, <clears throat> the, the sun rays decay exponentially with the distance, and then there is scattering because uh, the photons rebound on the molecule of air. Now, you cannot uh, uh, use um, uh, basic physics uh, to model the phenomena because it's, it's just uh, uh, too many photons. So you have to uh, rely on energy balance. So in the end, uh, we'll have to solve uh, in a cube with the valley at the bottom, uh, some equations where the source is the light, uh, is, is on the ground. And if you want to know the um, <clears throat> light intensity at the point, you have to take into account the radiation from the source, but also uh, all the radiation that comes from the uh, <coughs> scattering or um, the fact that air is hot. Right, so uh, there is a basic approximation is that uh, sunlight crosses the atmosphere in unaffected. Uh, <coughs> and therefore, if you use the black body Planck's black, bo black body hypothesis, it is the ground which is the source. So you have a, a radi radiation source here, which is mostly in the infrareds uh, because of black body and because of the temperature of the Earth. So from a mathematical point of view, you have two variables, the light intensity and the temperature. The light intensity is a function of the <clears throat> frequency um, because the, the phenomena it ranges all frequencies from zero to uh, I mean, for uh, of light and infrared light, and then there's a position in the in the domain and the direction of the light. So uh, you see that this this is uh, uh, direction of light is two. We are always in three dimension. Uh, the problem doesn't make sense in two dimension. So uh, two two variables here, three variables here, and one there. So we are in dimension six. And then the temperature is in dimension three. We have other variables like density. Uh, kappa is a very important parameter. It's the absorption. So it governs the rate of decay as a function of distance of I. So this is the general equation, uh, <clears throat> which you cannot understand in five minutes if you've never seen them. But anyway, it's a convection term plus a dissipative, a dissipative term and a scattering term. And the scattering term is an integral of some function times i. And then you have the source term for this equation, if you want, which is uh, written like this, where b is a Planck function. And uh, um, uh, the Planck function, in fact, you, get, you can write it this way uh, by rescaling all the variables. So uh, it, it's a reasonable function. And then you have the uh, equation for temperature, which you have seen uh, in many of the talks in this conference, people have studied that equation. I don't take the, the time term because I want to use to uh, study the static problem. And the temperature is driven by the source uh, of uh, uh, heat source, which comes from the radiative I. So you have to add initial and uh, uh, you have to add the uh, boundary condition, no initial condition. And uh, <clears throat> in, I'm going to present you the result in the case where the scattering parameter is zero because it's much easier for me. But all everything that I say uh, works 
uh, for a between zero and one. So then for a equals zero, this is a set of equation. It is still in dimension six. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, it's, um, it's a convection equation plus uh, with a source term. And then uh, this, this, is, this variable is a function of nu because kappa is a function of nu. So you take the, you take the average uh, and it's a function of the direction. Now the direction doesn't appear in the uh, equation for the temperature uh, because you take, it is the integral of J of I over all directions that drives the temperature. So first order equation, integral operator, linear integral operator and uh, non-linear equation for T. Right, so it looks pretty messy and uh, it looks impossible for the mathematics, but that is not so because you observe that B is an increasing function of T. If T uh, grows, B grows, and if B grows, then uh, it, I will uh, show you that I grow, and if I grow, J grow, and if J grow, T grows from this. And so uh, this is the key point to the solution. We're going to uh, uh, have a fixed point iteration where uh, I is the solution of this for a given T, and T is the solution of that for a given J. So uh, now for, uh, for, the, um, for, the, for the numerics, uh, I need um, to apply the method of characteristics and it's also useful for the mathematics. Now this is a messy slide, but uh, uh, let's try. So you all know that uh, the, this first order equation has a closed form solution due to the fact that we know the characteristics. And so you can write the equation like this. Uh, the, the, you need to give initial conditions, you, uh, sorry, boundary conditions whenever omega times uh, uh, normal, uh, the outer normal is negative. And so the general solution has the, what I call the source term plus an integral of, uh, due to a decay, an exponential decay along all rays, all on, along all the rays, uh, which is written like this. Now, I rewrite this in a much simpler way. This is the same. So you have the source term, and you see that uh, k is the integral from zero to tau of this guy, but it's actually physically, it's an integral from point x to point x gamma. So characteristic means if you are at a point x, you look at the, in the direction omega, where is uh, this line crossing the boundary gamma? So you call this point x gamma. So you integrate uh, the coefficient kappa on this line, on this segment. And you do the same thing here with the source s here. So in this form, it looks a, a lot nicer, okay? Uh, and it's numerically uh, tractable because uh, this can be computed numerically. Uh, there is a slight uh, uh, restriction is that omega needs to be convex. And if omega is not convex, what you have to do is to convexify somehow by extending kappa to be plus infinity. So uh, I come to the first, uh, to the, the key um, argument. If I look at an iterative process where I give the source and I compute the, radi the radiation intensity. Then I get the previous formula. It's the same formula, which I rewrote uh, with detail because now uh, at the boundary, I have this information. So this is the same as before. This is a solution by the method of characteristics. And then I compute the temperature by uh, taking, uh, except, sorry, except that here, I also, um, yes, all right. So now I compute the temperature by this equation, which is nonlinear. And here I have the integral for all nu of J, J being given by this. Then, then you can see here directly that 
if the iteration is, uh, uh, for example, if you start below the solution, you will have a monotone uh, convergence towards the solution. If Tn minus two is less than Tn minus one, then uh, B, as I said, B is uh, uh, this function here in red is uh, monotone increasing. And so you have this identity, this inequality. If you have this inequality, then you look at this, you simply look at this and you see that uh, you have the same inequality for J. And if you have this inequality for J, then um, you have by the maximum, but by the maximum principle here on this nonlinear equation. And that's where the mathematics goes is to, is to show that this equation has a solution and it is monotone. Now, it turns out that you can do the same thing in the opposite direction. If you start above the solution by the same idea, you have the same type of inequality. And so numerically, this is what's going to happen. Uh, this is a uh, temperature versus uh, X or versus altitude in my case. Uh, uh, so you, if I start below the solution, then uh, the solution is, is in black. I very quickly converge to the black. If I start above the solution, I converge to the black, but not so fast. So the theorem is that if you have decent data, so bounded uh, uh, um, absorption coefficient, uh, <clears throat> a scattering between zero and one, which is physical, if your source is not crazy, it has to be less than, uh, for some temperature, it has to be less than uh, the Boltzmann, the Planck function, then you can show convergence uh, of T and I, and you have therefore establish a solution T in H1 and I in L infinity of, uh, with respect to direction, position, and uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, frequencies. And they satisfy the PDE, which I wrote. Now the, the proof, uh, the detailed proof is going to appear in SIAM. Uh, actually, I, uh, the, the uh, Francois Gauls did the proof and I reproduce here the, uh, some of the results. Uh, so so uh, for example, if you take a source in L65, so the difficulty you see is that you're not, you are not in a, um, a variational, uh, framework because of the equation for I. So, um, and here you take the stationary, uh, the stationary equation for the, for, for the temperature. By the way, you will be given by Navier-Stokes. And at the, in this study, uh, Navier-Stokes is decoupled from the temperature. So if R is given in, L, uh, in this, L5 over six over five, then the solution exists and as uh, the regularity H1. And, uh, uh, and then you have also um, um, a maximum principle. If R prime is greater than R, then T is less, uh, T is less than T prime. Yes, right, it's written the opposite. So T is less than uh, T prime is greater than T. Uh, and the proof, uh, I don't think, uh, it's a good idea to go to the proof, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, okay, just a minute. Uh, <clears throat> you, you look at this quantity and uh, 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 you have a bound, which allows you to take a subsequence. Uh, so you see uh, uh, there's a small penalization, which is equivalent to the DT uh, time derivative of T. And you can um, uh, you can converge with respect to epsilon. Um, okay, so the um, the uniqueness is is uh, so existence is kind of easy, but uh, uniqueness is much more tricky, and that is really the input of Francois Gauss. Uh, so um, the theorem is that. If, if you can prove uh, this uh, estimate, uh, I mean, sorry, you can prove this estimates and this estimate is sufficient for uh, uniqueness. Uh, 
By the way, um, you need uh, something which is unusual, accretive operators, uh, which is a generalization of monotone operators when you don't have a scalar product. Um, this is the definition. You look in Wikipedia, you get details. Right, so what about uh, numerical implementation, which is uh, mostly in my domain? Well, obviously, the domain is discretized. Uh, we use the finite element method, so we use tetrahedra. Uh, the source uh, comes from the surface, so the surface is discretized. It doesn't have to be the same discretization as omega, but it makes life easier if it is. And then we use this iterative um, solution, which I explained, uh, which is uh, here. Uh, you compute the integral of the radiation in all directions. And for that, you have two, two integrals to compute, one in surface integral, which looks like a convolution operator. So maybe I should have said that. Um, you see here, it, uh, you have a, a convolution operator. You have x prime and x here, x prime and x, and here too. And that's nice because the kernel, um, it's, a it's, a, it's a decaying kernel with an exponential decay. And so we're going to use this uh, numerically. So uh, <clears throat> where was I? Yes. So you, you compute the surface integral and you compute the volume integral, which are a convolution, which looks like a convolution. And then you add all the, con uh, the contribution for, from every point, and that gives you J. Once you have J, then uh, you solve the nonlinear equation. So the nonlinear equation is uh, a bit uh, sensitive. Uh, so you have two methods. Either you use a Newton iteration, but I'm not sure I can prove that it converges in all cases, uh, or you use an um, uh, uh, auxiliary time operator. <clears throat> so method of characteristics again. And then uh, uh, if you write it this way, uh, you see that uh, this is um, a symmetric operator, so you can minimize the energy. So if you minimize the energy, you're pretty sure that it converge. Okay, so what about the computation of the integral? So uh, this uh, slide is only for people who know uh, uh, numerical methods. I'm sorry, I know that half of my audience is not there, but uh, we have only one, one uh, two slides like that. So um, J uh, is a variable with respect to X, so we use a finite element method. So it's written on the basis of the P1 finite element method. And if you do that, then uh, this element here is uh, made of two terms, uh, this one, which is a source, and this one, which is the product of a matrix times the Planck function. And the, and the matrix, as I said, is just like uh, a, uh, it's a kernel, a dec an exponentially decaying kernel. And same thing for the source. If you look at it, the source a bit more complicated because the normal comes in, the source comes in, uh, but uh, this is also an exponentially decaying operator matrix. And so uh, <clears throat> uh, now these integrals, uh, they are singular. So you have to be careful. So you can use, uh, we use five point quadrature if you are far away from the, if, if xi and x prime are far from each other. And we use the 25 um, points otherwise. And then, um, all, you know, if you ever solve the Maxwell equation in integral form, you have the same kind of um, uh, difficulties. And so we inherit all these, uh, this NOAA. And uh, uh, now an important uh, also observation is that this matrix depends on kappa, not on nu. Uh, and here, same thing, except uh, here. So, uh, so we don't we need as many matrices as there is. There are different kappas, not as many as there are different new. So, uh, so we use um, now these these programs are impossibly slow unless you do something. So we use the acceleration of H, with H matrix from Agbush. Uh, this is a well documented technique. 
Uh, <clears throat> so uh, what do you want to know about that? An H matrix is viewed as a hierarchical tree, tree of square blocks. The blocks are iteration between cluster of points, um, like a bit like the fast multiple methods. And uh, far field interaction blocks are um, reduced, uh, approximated by using a singular value decomposition with low rank. And if you use this uh, so-called partially pivoted uh, adaptive cross approximation, uh, then you don't need to compute the matrix in order to um, uh, simplify it. Or, uh, uh, so that's very nice. You choose, you choose a parameter R, R and then you have a compacted matrix, uh, which is a function of R, and R controls the Frobenius error, uh, which you do on the matrix. And so it looks like this. So you see, uh, this is a compacted matrix and you have the, the R, the number here is the R which is being used um, in order to make this construction. Okay, so now we go to the result. Um, uh, first, that I, I begin with the one dimensional case. What is a one dimensional case? Well, it, suppose that the land uh, was flat. So then you have the sun above, uh, which um, sends light to the, to the ground, but the ground is, is a plane. And so, uh, as I said, uh, it's the same thing as saying that the, the plan emits uh, radiation in all direction. And obviously it does not depend on X and Y, it depends only on the altitude. And so somehow it's a one dimensional problem. And indeed, uh, you, can, uh, you can simplify the algorithm uh, by using uh, uh, a, an exponential integral function E. And then uh, the, um, the equation for the temperature that I wrote before is uh, uh, here. Here I have no fluid and no uh, um, diffusion in the temperature. And then it becomes um, this nonlinear equation. I use Stefan formula because, um, which means that the integrals with respect to nu can be computed analytically. And the algorithm that was proposed earlier is just that. So T4 is equal to some source plus an integral of T4 minus one at the previous iteration. So you see, it's, uh, 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 it's pretty easy. Uh, that's the case when kappa doesn't depend on nu. If kappa depends on nu, it's a little more complicated, but not so bad. Uh, uh, you have to compute this integral for all nu, uh, kappa e as a function of nu, and then you have to solve this integral um, integral equation for uh, for t. So uh, no, yes, for t. So I suppose that this should be t n. And uh, so uh, these are data. This is very important, the fact that kappa depends on nu. So the absorption coefficient is very much a function of the um, frequency. And th these data on the lower left is taken from the Gemini measurements. And you see here, uh, the infrared is here and the uh, sunlight is uh, somewhere here, I suppose. And you see that there are, there are places for where uh, um, the light is, is absorbed. Uh, the coefficient is very big. And this corresponds to CO2, uh, one of them, uh, one, this one. And so, uh, uh, so what we do is we artificially change kappa in zones which we want to study. So here the blue zone and here the red zone. And we do this computation. And this is the result we get. We get the temperature. We get temperature here. In black, this is the temperature corresponds to the black kappa. In blue to the blue kappa, very small modification, very large modification of temperature. Well, very large, let's say uh, 5%. And red, uh, very small, but up. So if you if you change kappa in one zone, you get cooling. If you change kappa in another zone, you get heating. Uh, so this this is this is very interesting. 
but don't jump to conclusion uh, because we are not uh, climatologists and there are so many other phenomena. But anyway, this is known that in the high atmosphere, an increase of CO2 will cool the high atmosphere. This is known. And then the radiative uh, radiation intensity, I, so you see, I, you, said, uh, you see the number of points that you need. You need, uh, here I use almost 500 points uh, in frequency in order to get these curves and similar and similar displacement uh, with the blue and, and, uh, and the red. Uh, yeah, I forgot to say that um, uh, other numerical method than this one uh, is Monte Carlo, which is impossible when the domain is large and the uh, finite element method uh, directly on the equation. And that's not precise enough to get these curves. Okay, uh, uh, an academic problem. I have a pool with water and uh, I have a wind on top of the pool. And so it creates, this is a solution of Navier-Stokes equation. It creates a big eddy like this, hard to see. And I solve my equations. Uh, I solve now the coupled uh, um, one dimensional equation for the radiation, two dimensional for the temperature. Uh, and I get something which is pretty uh, obvious that um, the pool is heated by the sun, uh, red is hot, and the wind drifts the hot part towards the left because uh, the right because the wind goes to the right. So natural. Uh, uh, was well, something unexpected. So the temperature is fixed at the bottom. But if the temperature at the bottom is not cold, cold enough, then the heating of the sun will never stop and it will go to the boiling point um, of uh, water. A now a three-dimensional problem for, uh, no, let me, I don't think I have time, but I better skip to, the, to this one. So this is the full uh, three-dimensional problem that I told you. Uh, density of air uh, is decaying with uh, 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 altitude. There is snow above 2,500 meters. Uh, so uh, kappa uh, is, um, is one uh, at the ground and uh, uh, 0 0.3 above uh, when there is snow. Uh, which is, uh, I should change it. This is a very crude uh, um, model. Uh, so the, the ground is put into a cube. The Mont Blanc is at uh, uh, 4,800 uh, 4, meter altitude. So the cube has 10 kilometer uh, altitude to, uh, thickness. And I vary the inclination of the sunlight um, to get these three uh, things. So this is morning, this is noon, and this is evening. So in the morning, you see that uh, the light comes from the uh, left. So you see that the, 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 these uh, valleys, uh, is in the valley, the, this is lit, and so this is hotter. And here it's high and uh, not lit, so it's very cold. At noon, uh, essentially, the cool the cool places are where there is snow, and in the evening it's the opposite. This is this side which gets hot, um, and now the 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 temperature them, themselves are not so bad, but uh, not ideal. Uh, you can't read them, but they go from um, uh, minus uh, eighty to fifty, fifty six, and uh, so this is too the uh, this is too cold and a bit too hot, but that's normal uh, because uh, you don't have any diff heat diffusion. Uh, the temperature there's no wind, nothing here. Uh, but uh, the computation is quite uh, fast with this kind of grid. Uh, we and similar in vertical. Uh, I can do it in one minute on this computer. Uh, but as I say, this is still work in progress. Uh, now, uh, the, the convergence with respect to the mesh is also to be improved, but not so bad. Uh, on a coarse mesh, this is the range of temperature. On a finer mesh, this is this one. And on the finest mesh, this is this one. 
So maximum seems to be okay, minimum seems to be. But then you have to see also the minimum appears only in a very in a, at the very tip of the mountain or something. And the speed with respect to the number of points is linear due to this um, uh, H matrices. Um, the memory, uh, you need uh, more memory than usual, uh, 16 gig or 24 gig for the big. And par it's parallelized. Uh, this computer has eight core and it's perfect parallelization. Uh, I use uh, the free frame uh, software, which we wrote uh, at the university and which is free and available to everyone. It's a high level language for solving PDE. The influence of the snow. Uh, so uh, if I increase to the, no snow below 3000 meters, uh, not much change, but no snow at all, huge change. Uh, the, every, everything is hot now. The maximum uh, temperature at the tip of the Mont Blanc is seven degrees. So this is an interesting observation, but still, uh, as I, um, we have to take we have to take into account the fact that the uh, the um, the kappa is uh, varying va uh, vastly. So I'm beginning the computation, and uh, I know that the computation are, are feasible. Uh, seven minutes is instead of one. So my time is uh, not quite over, but uh, we may have some time for questions. Thank you. Uh, we have enough time for questions, please, please, please come here to, to say in the microphone. Yeah. Hi, Olivia, uh, I'm Yuri Silevsky. I have- Yeah, uh, Vasilevsky, uh, great yes. to see you. I'm going to listen to you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have two questions. Uh, first question is, uh, am I right that you are quite fast on your laptop because you have integral approach, you solve integral equations and you don't have to solve three-dimensional problem on finite element problems on three-dimensional meshes, right? You are you are right for the for the radiation. Yes, but, yes. But the temperature is, is solved um, on the three-dimensional mesh. But you see, uh, even the finest mesh is 200,000 points. And uh, to solve a uh, three-dimensional, I mean, the number of points is what counts. So uh, 200,000 points for the temperature equation is, is pretty reasonable on this machine. Yes, but how you manage to solve uh, 200 uh, systems with 200,000 um, yeah. unknowns on uh, your laptop? With... That, is, that is because I use an integral formulation. Otherwise, it's impossible. This is exactly what I meant. Yeah. Okay. Yes, and uh, the second question, uh, am I right that you are going to combine this uh, uh, code, this model, with uh, some climate models from some teams? No, no, uh, no. no uh, okay, the climate people are not mathematicians for most of them. I don't know anyone who is mathematician. I know one who knows a bit more of mathematics. The climate model is the work of a team. Uh, we have a couple in France. I'm sure you have some in Russia. And uh, uh, they do a very bad job with radiative transfer. Uh, they usually uh, take one point or two points for the radiative transfer in their model. And so uh, uh, the, in, I think in, in 10 years, maybe they will use this. But at the moment, they are com it's completely out of the question. Uh, because of computing time. I see. Thank you very much. Please, more questions? Uh, maybe I have a question. Uh, uh, Professor Pirano, could you show um, the slide where um, it was the... Uh, uh, you, you showed the H uh, matrices. This one? Yes. Mm, uh, am, uh, uh, if I am right, uh, the numbers uh, uh, in uh, rectangles uh, show uh, uh, what are, uh, uh, are, yeah. uh, are chosen 
in corresponding uh, fields. Yes. Uh, and I have a question. Uh, how uh, do you choose? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it, it's um, a very, very strange uh, thing. Yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, you, need, you need to experiment. Uh, we use only one R for the whole entire matrix. Uh, I mean, the, the R that you see here is, is uh, controlled by another parameter. Uh, um, depending on the uh, singular value decomposition and, mm -hmm. uh, and the matrix, um, uh, you can have an estimate of the error. Uh, you have two ways to look at it. You want to impose a compression factor. If you want mm -hmm. to impose a compression factor, you get an R. Uh, or you could try to impose an error, which gives you an R. Now, how to go from, from this to the R, which is used in the SVD, um, I'm not sure I can answer it. it it's, um, I, I can, I can um, maybe send you an email because I did not write this uh, part of the software, but uh, Pierre-Henri Tournier could, could answer you. Or, no, uh, or I send you reference. Okay, maybe uh, I am not a numeric person. I am a, a pure yeah. PDEist, uh, but uh, it looks uh, very strange. Why here you have forty-three, and uh, oh, in yes, the yes. next you have eighteen, <laughs> and so on. Yes, uh, uh, it's amazing. Yeah, but uh, you know, okay. The uh, why is it strange? Because um, this is um, an array with um, index i and index j, okay? And i and j correspond to points in space. And you don't know where these points are. So if I go from one little square to the next, it doesn't mean that the points are near to each other. I'm, I could be going from completely one part of the domain to the other. It depends on the numbering of my nodes. Mm -hmm. of, my, of my vertices. Yes, I, I, I get. Mm -hmm. So in, you are right that uh, it's, it may be a good idea to, to re renumber the vertices in order to get a better matrix. Uh, we have not done that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I have a question, may I? Yeah, sure. Yes, well, I, I'm impressed and I'm very pleased to see that you are doing these applications in climate models. And, but I was also surprised that you told that uh, the climatologists need 10 years to become convinced that this is a good model. Is that because you do not yet have the uh, enough prediction with your numbers, your physical parameters in Chamonix Mont Blanc, for instance, in order to convince them that the mathematical model is worthwhile or is for any other reason? Um, it's, it's because um, uh, it's because the <clears throat> the, 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 the model, the complete uh, climate model is made of blocks. So, so you want to just remove one block and change it to another one, right? Yes. Uh, to put at least a, a degraded version of this one in their model. I would very much like to do that. But you, is there is something you don't know, which is a little bit, little bit of a scandal. Um, well. Climate models are tuned to work. They spend, well, if you write a, a climate model and you take the equations and write everything and so on, it doesn't work. And so they change the parameter in order to make it work. But by this, I mean that they have a set of, um, of simulations uh, which are considered to be uh, correct. And your model should reproduce these simulations. And in order to do that, they change some physical parameter uh, because, because uh, there are approximation all over the place. And so um, I have a paper which is called tuning, uh, tuning a climate model, imagine. Uh, <laughs> it's a scandal, I tell you. Uh, but it's unfortunate, but this is, this is a state. Um, I mean, uh, you, you, we need a, a super fast computer to, to do better. Thank you. 
So I think there are more questions, but we have to stop here and thank the speaker again. Thank you.